Yeah, thank you very much for this introduction. I'm looking forward to this presentation. It is basically a summary of my work of the last five years uh, intensively and I'm, I'm not really the head of uh, this uh, botanical garden anymore. I'm um, uh, waiting uh, for the, my successor, but I still have um, this special situation that I'm half-half in the company. So, what we have here is a disclaimer. I'm talking about a real person. When you're t dealing with people from Shakespeare, immediately they tell you, uh, you know, the Oxfordians, will tell you I I immediately, hey, you are stupid, you don't know anything about this. Um, and they present 15 different types of authors. But I'm talking about uh, the man from Stratford, the great bard. So what you see here now, are some of the plants from Romeo and Juliet, not all of them. They are all plants that are not only mentioned uh, and they have a very important function as objects, um, but uh, also the knife is supposed to indicate this, uh, that um, they are used for poisonous attacks. So this is the author from Stratford. We don't know very much about him, but this is 400 years back now. 430 years back. We know actually quite a bit now uh, in research. We have certain manuscript pages. There's a folio here from the British Library from a play that has never been performed, Thomas Morris, a very interesting story. And there is actually a speech uh, against uh, xenophobia. Uh, Ian McKellen was given that. If you look it up in the internet, Ian McKellen, uh, you can actually listen to that speech spoken by an actor. Um, authentic picture, we're not so sure, but the man on the left-hand side, uh, that is a bust, which was uh, made shortly uh, after his death. Uh, we don't uh, think uh, that he would look like this, but he was a, a rich uh, citizen um, of Stratford and not just uh, some hip author from London City. So, this is a picture of the folio uh, and this is probably the basis for this bust. And then uh, there are a number of portraits that of course were made later, but from the lifetime of Shakespeare. But um, we don't know exactly how exact they are. And then there is this uh, death mask, which uh, is in our um, library, and it's not so sure if this is really Shakespeare or somebody else. Well, we know his works from the folios. Folio just means it's a large format. So the first edition um, and this was something that was done by one of his competitors, Ben Johnson. And he uh, put the first folio together um, and uh, bought the rights for that. And it was uh, printed um, bit by bit. Toilus and Cressida is in there, even though um, it is not mentioned in the table of contents. So, uh, the printing press uh, now is different than 400 years ago. And, and in there he says that the portrait of the author is not lifelike and that it's better to read his works. You would get more out of that. And I can only say that's true. 750 um, copies were made, 240 are still here. As a few years ago, another one was found in England. Uh, there is uh, the Folger Library in the United States, a very rich man. He bought folios all over the place and he has 82 of them, in fact. And this is a nice collection of texts and books from that time. So if you go onto the internet space of Folgers, uh, you will see it there. 
Yeah, now Shakespeare's plants, we're about 140, 150 species that are being mentioned. When we're saying species, we have to be careful. Uh, we also have in botany, uh, you know, there are 300 different types of daffodils. And uh, uh, very often uh, we are talking about completely different uh, types. And for yew trees, for example, it's only one, because in Germany there's only one type of um, yew. So you have to be careful when you say 100 different, 140 different um, species. But, of course, he inspired uh, the botanists. Uh, there is one called uh, Oberonio Titania. Uh, if you've ever seen Midsummer Night's Dream, you see that Oberon uh, is having a bad fight with Titania, his wife. And then there's this very odd wedding at the end. Uh, of the play. With uh, Shakespeare's weddings, you never know how long they last. Oberonia, Oberon and uh, Titania, it is also uh, a little bit shaky. And then there is the Prospero. Prospero is from The Tempest. And one of the uh, very special Shakespeare species is Calibinus. There it is, the only well, this is from the area of uh, Mexico, U.S. border country. And our uh, species is at, uh, 200 years old. There's none that is older than that. Caliban was a slave. Caleb was a slave in um, <coughs> Shakespeare's Tempest, just like um, in Oberon. Uh, of course, we have the connection to Shakespeare. Back then, um, who this is John Gerards. Um, he is the author of a book on plants called The Herbal or General History of Plants. So this is a bit in between botany and pharmacology and horticulture. And you may know the book by Leonard Book on herbs. Uh, and these were the reference um, works of the time. And he then wrote a very expensive book on plants. And um, he copied much of it and also um, added quite a bit. And this is then an herbal book of about uh, 1,300 pages. But the splinters were, in fact, shown at the uh, book fair in Frankfurt. Uh, they were actually German. And back in 1590, he uh, bought uh, those, uh, but we don't know if he ever returned them. But Gerard was proud, a bit uh, strange, but he would like to go to the theater. And, and there he talks about a special plant uh, that he found. And he was also, um, of course, uh, also a neighbor of um, Shakespeare's. And he also has the first show of a potato. Uh, and here uh, on, on the uh, in the portrait, um, he is looking at the potato plant, and uh, these knots, of course, are also a symbol for uh, testicles, and uh, therefore um, they uh, were knots uh, were shown, you know, for. Uh, an assignation with a married uh, woman, and that's why you have the tubers there. But it is probably one of the important sources for medicine at the time. Um, the military uh, doctor of Roman times in the first century also uh, referred to that. And, um, 
and uh, he was the uh, they had the the guild of the barber surgeons and he was the guild master and so the doctors of that time were not supposed to uh, ever uh, spread any blood, but uh, the doctor looked at the urine, he uh, looked at the pulse, but never shed blood. Uh, but when it was uh, very, very serious, then they had the barber surgeons, they were good people. Um, who were in high demand, so they were also the doctors uh, in the high seas where sailors had bad injuries and of course they were in direct competition with the doctors and Gerard, he was the guild master of um, these barber surgeons. As to the um, London theatre, you all know the rebuilt globe on the south bank of the Thames. The first theatre where his plays were shown, where he himself was also on uh, stage, that was actually on the northern bank of the um, Thames. But also you see the spelling was different and this was extra moors. Uh, so the Theatres were areas uh, of pleasure and they were surrounded by houses of pleasure, of four houses, and uh, they had dog fights there. And that, of course, was forbidden <laughs> inside the cities. And the Puritan city regiment, of course, did not allow for that. That's why whorehouses and houses of pleasure were outside the mirrors. And only then, afterwards, the theater was then taken off. And the wood was, in fact, um, used to build the new globe. Back uh, in Shakespeare's times, it was also burned down again. Then he left the theater and sold his place and went back to Stratford. What did it look like? Don't be angry that I go into so much detail because the use of the plants has to do with the theater. And this is the only image that we have of the theater from 1596. And you can see that the stage is totally empty. Maybe we had a throne, maybe a bed, maybe one person raising up. A shield, it is night. Have a look, closer look to Macbeth. A lot of times in Macbeth, he is praising to the, um, to the moon. And uh, well, the play took place at noon, so um, a lot of imagination was needed from uh, the public, from the audience, and we need kind of. Um, a backdrop, a scenery in, in the imagination of the uh, audience. And uh, when we have got, for instance, Aaron, uh, the black, a uh, black person, and then in this moment, the forest is changing. So the birds are singing and the snake is uh, Sleeping down, and then when when the same the forest is described by another another person, it's totally different. So you are to, a little uh, some words later. You're talking about a forest that is dying, and there's no sun, and so on. And then a person is dying and being killed, and a, a woman is raped and they cut the hands and the tongue and this is very brutal but it's just a representation uh, from Ovid and uh, Shakespeare took it for his ideas so it's not the same hundred percent they don't cut off the hands so it cannot only and then we have got a look at uh, those representations from Gerard and the right you see a skull where for the first edition of the book 
you are not using the German letters because, and you still need them. Mm -hmm. So we have got healing and poisoning plants in Romeo and Julia. We don't have to add anything about that. In Romeo and Julia, there is a scenery where a monk is collecting in the morning the, the, the plants and Romeo is using them later on. This representation, Julia was 14 years old by the, that time. So, obviously, those were very young people. Romeo was just a couple, oh, a little bit later. And the brother Lorenzo, one of these semi-doctors, so a monk who knows about uh, healing and he's collecting his healing plants and he's thinking about the effectiveness of these plants that have got a high value but when you misuse them they are just doing the contrary effect so <coughs> when we have got he talks about and this um, in these flowers, we have got uh, a poison and a healing power. So if you are smelling them, then it is a gaining of power. And it is both together. On one side, we have you are cruel, and on the other side, it's benefit. So the dosage is very important, and we are still valid until today and the dosage is important. A small dosage is healing, a higher one is killing maybe. And of course, poisoned plants. Uh, a lot of people are killed in Shakespeare. Uh, there are some representations where 70 to 80 percent is dying. So a lot of times they are killed. They are killed by uh, they're murdered, they're uh, killed secretly in the prison. Um, uh, they're executed, but they're put into death also by poisoning. Hamlet's father, Hamlet's mother, Hamlet by himself, Laertes and Claudius. So there are a lot of people dying with uh, poison. And the father has got some drops in their ears. Hamlet itself is uh, killed by a poisoned sword. And Claudius at the end uh, has also the sword uh, in his neck and he has to drink um, some poison as well. So all important people are dying. So. <clears throat> in King John, in Lady MacGill, Beth, she's suiciding herself, she's committing suicide maybe with some plant poisoning. King Lear is uh, never trusting a medicine and there are a lot of plants effectiveness, but um, if you have read uh, uh, Harry Potter, that uh, the monkshood is very important. It's very important and very poisoning. It's one of the most poisoning um, substances uh, in the European vegetation. So, not only he is talking about uh, the poisoning plants, and you need an extraordinary work from the actors. You need fights. The actors learned um, to perform the f in fans and what's for sword place. But imagine a, um, a poison murder. Was how uh, what, how he described how his stomach is really suffering and how he's really l having a lot of thirst having being thirsty so it was really very good solo for a good very good actors but they are poison even as a biological weapon or chemical weapon very known but now in the red list uh, is uh, the it's uh, the rye grass the rye grass looks similar to um, the wheat so in uh, in the in the Bible translation beforehand we were talking about the rye grass. Now we are always only talking about wheat, and um, 
and they lead to hallucination and um, to vomit and uh, the The uh, maid of Orleans is killed by that. So with this, um, with a really nice bread and has got a, so the British leaders who um, of the, he dies later on, but on natural way and and the image represents that, an image from uh, um, where a um, farmer is um, consulted to work properly so that the ryegrass is not in the wheat. Tutankhamun had uh, the ryegrass, uh, the pharaoh. Uh, received wheat in his grave and Lolch was represented and contaminating this wheat and this uh, weeds and tares show how the landscape is contaminated for instance in Kang Lear and Henry the f v Fifth. If you mentioned before, Hamlet's father uh, was killed with poison in the ear. Um, he got some droplets in his ear. Uh, this is a drama in Shakespeare. And Henry Fifthly, who uh, exp an expert, uh, who called himself Fifthly, and he illustrated several dramas and. He does that in a very strange way, and Hebenon received this drug in his ear. Hebenon, I have left this in, in the original version. Hebenon by itself is a distillation that is acting very quickly and has a similar effect as Quacksilver, and nobody knows how it is acting. So another author, Christopher Marlowe, from this time, it is a competitor of Shakespeare, and uh, they are the same age, and he died very young. Maybe by secret server, the death of Mr. Marlowe was never explained clearly. Maybe he worked for secret service, and was um, a victim of intrigue and he wrote a tragedy with a rich Jew from Malta and in this work uh, the Jew poisoned a, with, a, with Hebenon a whole monastery and how could that happen? Um, so doing the same uh, translation, it's called Bilzenkraut in German. It is a very poisoned plant, a night uh, owl, a no, night uh, shade family. It's a handbane. So we have the black handbane from um, Peru. This could be tobacco. So Hebenon could be main. Uh, an extract from this weed, and it's, I think it's not working properly as a poisoning. I think this is fantasy. Maybe Shakespeare by itself is giving the solution, because he was never specific when he mentioned the poison. He was also maybe afraid of some copiers, and Hamlet uh, is represented in the stage. And we have got a collection of weed that are collected in New Moon. So this is the Bilson crowd, the Hebenon. We have got also the Heben, or Jew in English, or Ebony. 
ebony that would be that's ebony wood and why this ebony wood that's from india and it was a very important uh, wood but what does this look what has this to do with uh, the ear of uh, hamlet's father so again going back to the door it is a tree from the cemetery and also um, we have this image from Fusli where it is acting as a poison and a Macbeth they are mixing the um, this drug what is inside in this um, drink and this potion so Typical Shakespeare puns, scale of dragon, tooth of wolf. I think that he was not thinking about the Jews. He was just uh, you and Jew, and uh, that Jew and Jew both has the same pronunciation. And this type of puns, you have them very often. Uh, they are very popular by that time, so that the audience was very happy with that and uh, Shakespeare was really a maestro using these types of wording and so again I wanted to um, show you these different options that we have also as a cemetery tree at Romeo and Julia Hebenen, Eben, so Ebony. So having a closer look to another um, definition we have got uh, a lot of similarities to uh, our pandemia. Uh, the discovery of, of America brought syphilis. We had that beforehand in, in Europe, but what has happened then? A variant of concern. This means a new variant and a variant that is very dangerous and that was a higher virulent traits that affected more the Europeans than the indigenous people of America and 1492 it was in Spain and 93 in Italy with a military action and those people distributed in France and in all of Europe so three years later the syphilis was in all Europe so it was a Spanish sickness, Spanish disease as the pox. So compared with pox, morbus colicos, the French sickness, the German disease in Poland, a French disease and 1530 is called syphilis, uh, where an Italian writer mentioned this name. So these are the first publications. And what was the reason of syphilis? It has to do something with uh, the where Saturn and uh, was in scorpions and scorpion is um, has to do uh, for the genitals and this was the reason. So um, the sky above us, Maria is uh, punishing uh, the human. Jesus is punishing with um, the human beings and Maria is giving uh, the crown to uh, King Maximilian. This is represented by Mr. Dürer, Albrecht Dürer. You can see that uh, syphilis affected person. The pest was already known and it was also known far beforehand and the syphilis was something new and it was not able to be treated and then going again to this barber surgeon so they were totally on that and okay I have to wrap up <laughs> And how have the, you treated the syphilis beforehand? So based on the Arabic uh, medicine with quicksilver, the Arab medicine has always treated um, um, skin diseases with quicksilver. And you have a look at the fast top. You see these uh, vessel, they were uh, with uh, 
naked on this top and they were on vapor of quicksilver and they were put on the quicksilver and they had to sweat and drink a lot. And this was one of the first chemotherapy, so the treatment with quicksilver. And people healed when they got uh, um, a, only a local infection and was not generalized. And then the victim of a syphilis, you see them on the left, left side, losing their hair, um, a reduction of muscle tissue. These are the last, well, and the syphilis was very of, happening very often in Europe. And the pock hole, hole wood was uh, the miracle. God brought the plaque, but also so sent help. And you have only to look for this, for this help. The indigenous people used this um, wood, and it was a very, very dark wood, sim similar to ebony, cut it into people, and in the prison, the people that were the they had to rasp uh, those wood and it was weighed and cooked and the patient has to drink it uh, with a hat to sweat a lot and the doctor with uh, this um, well, it's showing the patient uh, a model of uh, this um, wood. And why is that? You can see that on uh, this uh, very impressive image from Nuremberg, because it is a whole house. You can see that at the image. And this pock hold uh, wood was enriching the fugger because they were had the monopole they sold is and you have got now a seller of this wood you have got a doctor with a patient who is buying this weed and propaganda the propaganda was uh, carried out with Ulrich from Hutten this was a politician uh, he was uh, also a poet of the 16th century and you can see this bank where he is selling the product and the Fugger family sorry and um, Aurelius Therapastos Bombastos formerly known as Paracelsus was also sick with um, syphilis and found out um, that um, the wood wasn't useful and he wanted to print a book. And the Fugger family um, well, could avoid this print. And just a couple of years afterwards, it was uh, he was able to... Um, he is the founder of the chemotherapy, so he was the... He, was part, well, he was one of the one who noticed that the, these therapy of wood was useless. So we are still with uh, with quicksilver was the most effective one. So the classic penicillin without any resistance, it's still working, as you know. All right. I think I should be coming to an end here. I'm being told, and. I thought it was 45 minutes. Uh, that's why uh, I have to shorten this a bit. Everything is fine. Great. Sorry. We, we stopped this at this point. Um, but I, I wanted to make one last connection with Hamlet. So we read that it was Hebenon, Heben and Ebony. And that left, went through Hamlet's father's blood circulation like quicksilver, like mercury. 
And that may be a hint that only people in his time understood. And that happens with a lot of the things about Shakespeare, that many of the hints and um, uh, will have to be understood in his time. So maybe he was in fact suffering of syphilis. And it was probably that poison that killed him because in other parts it was obvious that uh, Hamlet's father did enjoy life and had a bit of a very, very relaxed uh, life and didn't too much uh, care about um, his physical health. So, if you want to read Shakespeare, read Frank Kunter's translation. He translated uh, Shakespeare and he passed away last year and of course uh, the important plays are at DTV and the histories, especially uh, with the exception of Richard III, you find in a very nice edition at the Stauffenburg. Uh, um, but please do read Shakespeare, uh, do take your time and go to the theater in Wiesbaden. Uh, we have King Lear uh, opening. So it's the premiere for King Lear tomorrow night. Or take your time out, take a beautiful time out for a film. There's a nice Hamlet <laughs> uh, movie production. And this is a incredible British author writing to us from a distant past. Thank you very much. Join us here. Stefan, this was great, but you concentrated on Shakespeare. Is that out of the ordinary? Or do you think that Goethe uh, would also have had uh, so many botanic references with Goethe? That's a bad example. Goethe, yes, he, he would have had that. But Goethe was a scientist at the same time. So he did also his botanic research, whereas Shakespeare had a, a completely different approach. And what is important for me to say and to point out at this point of time, he knew the plants um, and he could imagine that uh, the people who were watching his plays knew these plants because many of these puns, uh, many of this double entendres can only be understood if you actually know the plant and if that makes it so difficult for us now. Because that knowledge, what hemlock is used for, um, that uh, you used uh, certain leaves when people were having hallucinations and so on, that is something that people are not aware of today. You know, only the ones uh, that you know from Harry uh, Potter, Mandrake, for example, that also pops out in Romeo and Juliet. And uh, it was the bandwidth of the knowledge of his time. He knows everything. He knows the mythology and he, he, he knows what people knew. And things got lost. Did we lose knowledge? I mean, if the Fuggers were commercializing it and monopolizing it, then uh, it was passed on to a financial service provider. So would that be still present and usable today? Usable probably not. Um, well, what happens is that uh, what Shakespeare works with is the knowledge that I know what a carrot looks like. I know what a carrot looks like in our deep freezer, but not what it looks like in the earth. I mean, Shakespeare knew what mustard looks like um, or hemlock. And in uh, Rhein Hessen, there was so much hemlock. I could have, I could have poisoned everybody. And I told the mayor, and I told him, "This is dangerous." Um, but people were not aware of that. And so I, I showed them pictures of a road and the roadside was full of hemlock and but of course people uh, may mix it up with um, 
carrot, uh, somebody who collects herbs, they would pull it and uh, they uh, wouldn't uh, take out any bulb. But it is extremely dangerous and poisonous and they like uh, hot weather. So, uh, when you look at these plants, what kind of developments do you see compared to today? We heard from Professor Pauls about uh, animals and insects. What are the developments in plants? Well, I can't tell you anything about that. These are wild plants, um, of course, today, and this is another aspect. Um, we probably, uh, you know, wouldn't be able to mix up any type of uh, wheat and lols and, and, and wheat. Uh, in biblical times, they were completely different. But now, uh, you would say, you know, leave it there and only uh, uh, then you, you should do the harvest uh, later when the rye grass is... Um, ripe because ryegrass is a lot smaller than wheat but wheat now uh, we made it big uh, uh, it is a starch provider and a huge animal but uh, that's not what it looked like then when I think of uh, Tarantino I think of um, the deserts but the stuff of uh, Shakespeare was much more dramatic and more blood <laughs> so there was no such thing as the good old times, never. And you have to say, this story about the syphilis, of course that was passed on through the whorehouses. Uh, in London at the time, there was uh, one whorehouse for 100, 150 inhabitants. Imagine that. But not only that, remember? Last year in Brazil, COVID, it started off in the area of the uh, poor population and then it was passed on to the rich families because of their the um, domestic staff. But uh, and the same happened back then. It uh, was the wet nurse. Um, they came from you know, those poor families and they then got into the houses of the rich people. Okay, lots of material in your presentation. You know me, uh, I am always uh, struggling with the details and I keep forgetting it. If I want to know more, uh, I know um, that uh, you have at the Städel uh, some of these old herbal uh, gardens. Do you have that in Darmstadt too? Yeah, we had a an exhibition a few years back, and there was uh, a special uh, Shakespeare forestation, but only all over the garden, not in one specific place, because most of them are domestic plants. There are no exotic plants. There are some uh, plays in Shakespeare take place in in, in Asia Minor in in, in uh, Egypt, but there is no such thing as the. Athens Garden and the Midsummer Night's Dream. It's always England. So that's basically the same as what we have in Germany. All we had to do is uh, allocate which is which. So the red rose uh, and the white rose of the Lancasters and the red rose from the Yorks. And um, So here uh, we have uh, those wild smelling flowers that are good against uh, melancholy. So <clears throat> I could do that. But you, of course, have to think about what season we're talking about. Well, you had a lot of press back then. That's uh, going to be exciting what your successor is going to do now that you have done it for so many years. Uh, well, he will have to do something completely different. Um, he will be uh, close to, more closely connected to science. It will go on. It will move on. And it is more important for me that somebody brings the garden forward to the future than to continue what I did. So the private investor who says, all right, I, don't, um, I didn't get any tips in terms of investment, but what would you tell um, somebody who is an investor? What kind of articles should you read, apart from the books that you mentioned from Shakespeare? 
hatte damals einen Ausstellungskatalog gemacht, der war aber innerhalb von wenigen Tagen I had a catalog back then, but unfortunately we sold out within days. I'm now writing a book and I hope I can finish it this year. That's always uh, the conundrum. If you can't do it this year, uh, uh, I can't do it anymore because then uh, I will get, I will lose the <laughs> money from the university, the contribution.